Uh, good evening, uh, Mount Moriah. Thank you for being on the prayer line as well as our website and Facebook page to engage in Bible study on today. And I want to take this opportunity again to uh, thank Deacon Azada Williams for uh, leading us in our noonday prayer uh, via our conference line. And again, thank you for watching tonight either on YouTube or our Facebook page, our website, or our conference line. As usual, if you have any questions or comments on Facebook, please put them in the comments page, and Brother Parker will relay those to me. And I want to thank him for leading us in our audio-visual ministry as well. So tonight we're going to take a look at Psalm 131, which is a very short psalm, uh, but it is filled with so much good and pertinent information. So please turn in your Bibles, whether you have the actual paperback or hardback in hand, or if you have your computer open or cell phone or your tablet, please, please, laptop, please turn to Psalm 131. Psalm 131, New International Version, it reads this way. My heart is not proud, O Lord. My eyes are not haughty. I do not concern myself with great matters or things too wonderful for me, but I have stilled and quieted my soul like a weaned child with his mother, like a weaned child is my soul within me. O Israel, put your hope in the Lord both now and forevermore. Amen. Let us pray. Father, we do thank you and we do praise you for this opportunity to come tonight to study. We praise you for those who are viewing and listening on tonight. We ask and pray that you would help us to be the, the disciples that you have called us to be. And we ask and pray that you would be the ultimate teacher on tonight. In the name of the Christ, we pray and give thanks. Amen. Tonight, we're going to uh, name this psalm like a weaned child, like a weaned child. And so as we begin tonight, um, there are numerous metaphors that are, are going on. Uh, but if you are a mother uh, who has breastfed uh, your child at some point or your baby at some point, uh, I want you to have that in the forefront of your mind. Um, uh, one of my children uh, was breastfed, so um, all day long as I've been looking at this text, um, this has been at the forefront uh, of my mind as well. It will help us to understand the metaphor uh, that God is using on tonight, and I want to tell you uh, from the beginning that I believe that this is a revolutionary chapter, and I will share that in, in a few moments. So we've been talking about this song of ascents. The song of ascents comprised Psalms 120 through 134, and, and tonight we are dealing with the 12th of 15 Psalms, Psalm 131, and we have entitled Like a Wean Child. These songs of ascents were psalms that throughout the history of Israel had been written and comprised and sung, but these 15 psalms, some way or another, became a compilation uh, of psalms that were sung as the pilgrims left their homes on their way to Jerusalem to a festival or some type of festive activity. 
So tonight we have specifically a mother who has, we believe, a child in her arms and she has left home and she is on a pilgrimage to Jerusalem with that child. Or maybe she has entered into Jerusalem with her child. This is not unusual because, as I said a few moments ago, uh, persons left their homes and as they got closer and closer to Jerusalem, uh, the number of pilgrims increased tremendously by the time they got into Jerusalem. So it would not be anything unusual for there to be a mother with a child in her arms as she was making that pilgrim to Jerusalem along with other mothers and other families which had children. So we believe um, that Psalm 130 and 131 should be read together uh, because they, they both talk about this whole notion of hope and this whole notion of waiting on God with expectancy, this whole notion of trusting in God. And if we make an analogy to what we are experiencing now, we are in a situation, this pandemic, in, in which we have no other choice but to put our hope in God, whether we are going to um, leave our homes, go to restaurants, et cetera, et cetera, as the DMV opens up. Uh, once we do that, we are going to have to put a tremendous amount of trust in God. It also uh, talks about humility. We see in Psalm 130 this whole notion of humility uh, being brought forth uh, for waiting on God is done with humility. And, and those who wait upon the Lord express humility. Uh, but we see this humility expressed further in Psalm 131. The interesting thing about this psalm is that, and this is the first time that I have said this in the psalms that I have taught, and I have overwhelmingly um, taught the majority of them, I would say that out of the 131, I probably have taught 121. But this is the first time I have said uh, that I believe that the writer of this psalm is a woman. And uh, many scholars believe that as, as well. Uh, and therefore, that's why I say uh, that I believe that this is a revolutionary uh, chapter. The imagery of verse 2 uh, help us to come to that conclusion uh, where she says, but I have stilled and quieted my soul like a weaned child with his mother, like a weaned child is my soul within me. Uh, again, <clears throat> we believe that this is a mother who is singing uh, this psalm as she carried her child to Jerusalem, perhaps even to the steps of the temple. And, and so verse 2 alludes us to this imagery that involves the experience of a mother and a child. So we believe, I believe, uh, that this psalm is authored by a mother, and this mother is giving us her own experience of comforting her children use that metaphor of her comforting her children um, to basically talk about God doing the same, God comforting Israel. One of the things that has been talked about much during this pandemic is the role of women in ministering the African-American church. Uh, when I got here 20 years ago, uh, we had a conversation uh, about that, and uh, we made it very clear 
uh, that when it came to licensing and ordaining women, um, that we as a church had no problems with it. And not too many years after that, we ordained women deacons, and now uh, we have combined our uh, deaconess and deacons ministry into one ministry um, because uh, we believe that the women have the gifts and talents that are necessary in order to do to do ministry. And, and yet and still, we are uh, one of the few churches in the District of Columbia, the DMV in general, uh, who does not mind uh, placing women into ministry. This whole notion of women in ministry has been the talk of so many Zoom and Facebook conversations over uh, the time of this pandemic, because when it comes to ministry, and not only in, in ministry, in society, whether it is in the for-profit world or non-profit world, uh, women basically are slighted in so many cases. For example, women uh, typically do not uh, get positions that men get, and it is a known fact that women, when they get those positions, uh, they are not paid nearly the same amount as men. And, and so even when it comes to the Bible, the Bible is a patriarchal book. It is a, a book that is uh, looked at, written from the most part from a male perspective, and, and we see a lot of household codes in the Bible uh, that basically um, exclude women. Even though Paul may have said in, in Galatians, there is neither Jew nor Gentile, male nor female, slave nor free, uh, when we uh, look at 1 Corinthians, we see uh, that women were oppressed and, and therefore uh, Paul, because of the household codes in Corinth, uh, talked about a woman um, not speaking in public and, and not having her, not leaving the house without her head being covered and having long hair, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Well, we still have uh, many sexist household codes uh, that take place in our world today. But here we have an example of a woman author of, of a song. Now, I'm sure uh, there have been other women authors. Um, I'm sure that there have been others, but this is the first time that we have alluded to one. Now, this whole notion of God uh, being called mother or this metaphor of God as mother is, is not anything new. We see many instances throughout the Bible in which um, God is referred to in, meta, in a metaphor way as a, a female or as a woman. Now, I know that that's not going to set too well uh, with some people, but let me just give you an example of what I'm talking about. We have used this whole notion of refuge many times in our study of the book of Psalms. And one of the things, or one of the metaphors that I have used is that of a mother eaglet. When her mother eagle, rather, when her eaglets are in trouble, spreading out her wings and covering her eaglets. And when we talk about God as being refuge, we use the metaphor of God as a mother who takes care of her children. And so we do know that God is not male nor female, uh, that God is spirit, but if we can refer to God as he, uh, then we can refer to God as she. I particularly uh, do not like either. Uh, I just like referring to God as God. Uh, but there is uh, so much imagery of God being uh, 
uh, female or as God metaphorically uh, being talked of as a mother. And we see that imagery again in, in verse 2. So uh, with all of that in mind, I hope that that did not tune anyone out. I know that we are in a male-dominated society, um, even um, though the church in many instances is 70% women, uh, churches are still uh, the decision makers in many cases are, are men. And uh, I'm going to, to leave this and come back to it in a few moments. Uh, I've always said to our women in, in ministry here at Mount Moriah, and we have um, those who have come this way who are uh, working in pastoral ministry now, um, that they have to be three or four times as good as men in order to get the positions uh, that they would have received if they were male. I would venture to say that our women preachers here at Mount Moriah would be uh, pastoring now if they were men. Uh, so women, especially in the Baptist church, uh, whether it's African American or not, uh, do not always get a fair shake. And Mount Moriah has always been on the cutting edge of women in ministry, and we're, we're going to continue to do that. So with that in mind, let's, it's only three verses, but it is jam-packed uh, with so many other nuggets that we want to share tonight. So let us read verse 1. Verse 1 reads, My heart is not proud, O Lord. My eyes are not haughty. My heart is not proud, O Lord. My eyes are not haughty. This psalm begins with a series of three negatives that basically shun pride and arrogance. Verse 1, My heart is not proud, O Lord. My eyes are not haughty. I do not concern myself with great matters or things too wonderful for me. In verse 1, when we see this word heart, it is actually translated or can be translated as mind. My heart is not proud, O Lord. My mind is not proud, O Lord. So it suggests, verse 1a, my heart is not proud, O Lord, it suggests that there are some in internal matters that are going on. The psalmist, despite those matters, she stresses that she is free of destructive pride and arrogant thoughts. We we'll talk about why we believe that that is in a few moments. We see her also saying in verse 1b, my eyes are not haughty. So not only is she going through some internal matters, she's also going through some external matters. The eye sees externally. So we do know uh, that raised eyes or conceited eyes are associated with destructive behavior. So the psalmist affirms that in both thought and deed, she has been humble. She has been humble both in thought and deed. Now, when we talk about this whole notion of, of great matters and things too wonderful for her, um, these are understood typically or ordinarily as thoughts and deeds of the arrogant, those who are self-centered. They concern themselves with great matters and things too wonderful for them. But she does not have that same problem. She has humbled herself, so she does not concern her, thing, her, her mind with great matters or things too wonderful for her. And, and therefore, she is able to remain humble. So... There is something else that may be going on in the, this text. 
And so she's humble, so therefore she does not seek these self-centered pursuits. She seeks to avoid them. Some scholars believe that there's also something else that's going on here. Um, some scholars believe that because she was a female in a male society, uh, that there were role restrictions that were placed upon the women in biblical times. In, in other words, it was inappropriate during biblical times for women and mothers to care about things too wonderful and, and to care about matters that were too great. They were not able to think about those things because those things were not able to come to fruition because they were not able to seek those things concern themselves with great matters or things too wonderful for them. So this restriction may have been upon her and therefore she was not able to think about these matters anyhow and was able to remain humble. But whether that was the case or not, even if she was able to engage in great matters or things wonderful, she does not do so because she is a person who practices humility. Now, let, let, me, let me just, I said this on Mother's Day, I gave uh, kudos to mothers, especially during this time. Mothers have so much um, to do. Uh, mothers are taking care of children, taking care of spouse, home, as well as working at home and in the midst of all of that, uh, working at home is hard enough, but having to prepare meals to make children are bathed and dressed and up in the morning and on the internet um, for school, doing school work and then having to be on Zoom and Facebook and all of those things. Uh, I know that it, it once again tells how a mother is multifaceted. I've said numerous times that I could not uh, have done that when uh, our children were, were younger, um, but I know unequivocally that their mother would not have had any problems doing so. Uh, and in this Me Too movement, I also realized that there are some fathers who do um, a, a great job, but for me, um, and I'm talking about me only because I want to stay out of trouble, I, I could not have done uh, the job um, that the mother of my children, children did. And then if it was during this time, I know that I probably would have to uh, pull my hair out. And I know in the days to come, uh, because women work and have to work, uh, that they will have to make some important decisions in the next day, next days to come as things begin to open back up uh, and they are required to go back to work as to what to do with their children, etc. Uh, so we are praying for uh, mothers during this time uh, as as well. So. Uh, it was inappropriate for women during this biblical time to, to care about things too wonderful and things uh, too great. And, and we're not where we should be, uh, but thank God that we are living in, in a society, in a country where women are able to, to dream big, to go after big things, to go after great matters and things that are, are wonderful. So we see um, in verse 1, this, this woman, um, or actually in verse 2, the psalm is this woman finding a calmness of soul, a peace of mind and heart uh, that is probably denied her by her social setting. Uh, one of the things that I want, want to emphasize is that if we really want calmness, if we really want peace of mind and heart, uh, we have to practice humility. Arrogance and conceit and the desire for the riches of this world 
uh, many times can lead to this arrogance um, that we have been, been talking about and arrogance and conceit and, and the desire for things of the world uh, can have us frantic, uh, can have us upset, can have us stressed out, rattled, etc., etc. Um, but humble people tend to have this calmness of soul, uh, this peace of heart and mind uh, that people who are otherwise do not have. So we see a mother who is calm and at peace. As I thought about this, um, most mothers um, are at peace, are, uh, are calm when they uh, have their children and when their children are, are connected to them and, and close to them. It is when their children are away and not in their presence many times in which this calmness of soul and peace of heart and mind is not within them. Um, so this is a very interesting first verse, and it is a lot uh, that is in verse 1. Have any questions or comments, um, please send them to Brother Parker on our Facebook page. Verse 2, but I have stilled and quieted my soul like a weaned child with his mother, like a weaned child is my soul within me. So she talks about this quietness and this, this stillness of soul. And she compares it to a child that, that has um, been weaned by his mother. When the child breastfeeds, that child is still, that child is, is quiet. Even when that child is weaned, whenever that child uh, feels uncomfortable, Whenever that child feels at ease, whenever that child is distressed, what does that child do? Uh, that child typically finds his mother, and, and that child lays his or her head on his mother's breast. The mother is a place of comfort. The mother is a place of nurture. I see my sons do it many of times. Many of times, um, if they uh, really uh, wanted uh, affection, if they really wanted consolation and comfort, uh, they would go straight to their mother. And there were times I would walk in the house and, and they were cuddled up with their mother. And I walked in and said, or in the room and said something like, uh, what are you doing laying on your mama? The male notion basically um, says, you know, be tough, you know, don't cry, suck it up, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but uh, a mother has uh, a softer side uh, that their fathers typically do not have. So uh, this woman basically says, I find peace in God. When I accept God, I find peace. When I trust in God, I find peace. Just as a child does, weaned or unweaned, when he is or when she is upon her mother's or his mother's breast. And so the beginning of verse 2 is emphatic. But I have stilled and quieted my soul. Despite destructive circumstances, she says, I have stilled and quieted my soul. Even though she has humility, and that humility might be indicated by society, or even that humility might be consistent because she does not go after great matters or things too wonderful for her. 
she still has this peace and tranquility. She has an equilibrium. She has an equilibrium. And I think that that's powerful. When she says, but I have still inquired to my soul, uh, that means that everything is good with her. It means that everything is even. It means that everything is smooth. Even though in this predicament, she has found equilibrium. She has found peace. She has found calmness. She has found quietness. She has found tranquility. Why? Because she has put her hope in God. And she has gone to God for security, and God has become her security. So she has security with God like a child has found with her. Again, think of a mother wrapping her arms around her child. Security. I know there used to be a time when you used to see um, babies who may be frantic, who may be crying, who may be hysterical, or it may have been time to go to sleep. And the mother takes that child and puts that child on her breast and rocks that child to sleep. That child goes to sleep because that child finds security in his or her mother. Same thing. The psalmist, she says, um, that I find security in God like a child has found with me. She also was saying that she will not be the slave of two masters. In other words, despite her predicament, despite the age that she lives in, um, she uh, would not uh, be tempted by those who dominate her. That God is her master, that God is sovereign. And, and let me just say here um, that we are mutual servants of one another. And I know I'm getting a little ahead of myself, uh, but let me go to, to the New Testament, uh, Mark chapter 10, verses 41 through 45. Mark chapter 10, verses 41 through 45. Oh, and it reads this way, when the ten heard about this, they became indignant with James and John. That, that whole conversation about um, who, will be, who will be the greatest. Uh, Jesus called them together and said, you know that those who are regarded as rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them. And their high officials exercise authority over them, not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant, and whoever wants to be first must be slave of all. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. So we are mutual servants of one another. We are to serve one another no matter what our gender is. But just think about this whole notion of security. Think about this whole notion of calmness of soul and peace of mind and of heart. So what has happened is, is that since she has put her hope and trust in God, this has given her humility, and, and this humility has given her a calmness of soul and a peace of mind and of heart. And what has actually taken place is that she has been set free from God, or she has been set free by God. She has been set free by God, and this is a liberating experience for her. Just think about it. She's not worried about matters too big or too wonderful. She's not worried about things too big or too wonderful. What she has done has put her trust in God, and as a matter of putting her trust in God, she has been set free by God, she has been liberated by God, and therefore she's not concerned about the things of the world, 
She has a peace and a calmness uh, that the world cannot give. Again, goes back to what I said earlier. Um, those who are humble are pretty much those who are set free and not worried about uh, the things uh, of this world. And, and you can have uh, a peace, a calmness of heart, mind, and soul uh, when, you, when you depend upon God. Again, um, we have uh, this whole notion of despite her restrictive circumstances, she has been liberated, she has been set free by God. Now, we see this whole notion of child in verse 2, like a weaned child with his mother. Like a weaned child is my soul within me, in me. We also know in biblical times, women, children, and orphans were the divided class in the ancient world. And when it comes to women, orphans, uh, children, and people of color, uh, in our modern world, um, those are the devalued classes. Um, again, this child is not an infant, but it is a, a weaned child. And let me go back to this, having once found acceptance and satisfaction and, and nurture at the mother's breast, the weaned child returns to comfort and security uh, to a mother's loving embrace. Again, uh, the child in trouble, child having a bad day, child crying hysterically, no matter if they are four years old or 18 years old, uh, I found um, that they find comfort right at the breast of their mother. And so, um, again, uh, we see the same thing applying that her comfort and her security comes from God's loving embrace. She's not concerned about the things of verse 1. She realizes that she cannot be concerned about the things of verse 1. Instead, she is quiet and still. She is nurtured by God, comforted by God, and she finds uh, security in God's love and embrace. So we too, if we are humble, can be nurtured by God, comforted by God, finding security in God's love and embrace. Just think about what you might be going through on today. Um, just, just think about it and just think about God taking God's arms and placing them around you. It's, it's a good feeling, isn't it? Knowing that we are nurtured by God, uh, comforted by God, and can find security in God's love and embrace. So that's verse 2. Again, any questions or comments uh, for Brother Parker, uh, you can send them to our Facebook page. Verse 3 says, O Israel, put your hope in the Lord both now and forevermore. Verse 2 prepares for and interprets verse 3. Her oppression, the mother's oppression, caused her to seek and find comfort in God. And let us not try to justify oppression. Oppression cannot be justified. But for those of us who uh, have gone through or are a, an oppressed people, uh, we realize that we can seek and find comfort in God. So this gives us a glimpse of the equality of women in God's sight. So... Um, in God's sight, uh, we believe that men and women are equal. So we see this image of a loving, a caring, a comforting mother uh, embracing her needed child, and this portrays Israel's hope. Let, let, me, let me go back uh, for, for a moment. Uh, we, we as a church... Uh, need to ensure 
that we have equality everywhere within our church in every ministry um, in whatever we do there needs to be equality and, and that is something um, that we must strive for and we cannot allow for our women to be devalued I'm talking to the men of our church now too there has to be um, this protection of women in our church. So when women uh, come to our church, uh, they should feel protected. Again, I want to be very careful because I'm not saying that women cannot protect themselves, um, but as uh, a man, I believe um, that that's what we should do. We should, when women walk into the church, uh, they should feel as if something happens, um, that they are going to be protected and, and not devalued and, and not hit upon and not disrespected, um, but that they are going to be treated as equal. And so often in the church we have uh, done just the opposite. There has not been equality in the church. Uh, but we want to make sure um, that, that, that that happens. So here we see something very interesting. We know the nature of humankind. We are rebellious. We are sinful. We are wicked. And we are God's people. But even though we are sinful, even though we are wicked, even though we are rebellious, one thing that we know that God will do, God will give us continually a loving embrace. Despite our sins, our rebellion, etc., God still puts God's arms around us to protect us, to give us the security, to tell us that God loves us. And even sometimes we inflict pain upon ourselves. We inflict pain upon others and when we do not do what we are supposed to do, when we are disobedient to God, we inflict pain upon God as well. But despite us, God still loves us so much that if we humble ourselves, God will place his arms around us and, and, give, and give us the same loving embrace as a mother gives to her children. When we talk about the love of God, it's so incomprehensible. And when we think about God, God's grace is so amazing. And so what it does is, is that it gives Israel hope. And the psalmist, she is saying, she's given this exhortation, put your hope in the Lord, not only now, but forevermore. And that is a good word for us. We need to put our hope in the Lord, not only now, but forevermore. Why? Because God is loving, God is compassionate, God is a loving and compassionate mother who is oftentimes grieved by our actions, um, but he welcomes us back. He welcomes us, or she welcomes us, referring to God, into her arms to hold us up as we go through our difficulties. So for us as Christians, we should have the same type of childlike dependence and faith upon God for life now and for life evermore. So that's Psalm 131. Now let's look at what Jesus says about this. Um, let's, let's turn to uh, some New uh, Testament scriptures. Uh, the first is Matthew chapter 18. Matthew chapter 18, verses 1 through 4. Matthew chapter 18, verses 1 through 4. 
It reads, at that time, the disciples came to Jesus and asked, who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? He called a little child and had him stand among them. And he said, I tell you the truth, unless you change and become like little children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, who humbles himself like this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. So uh, the whole notion is that we see Jesus performing the role of mother as he took children into his arms and commended them as role models for us, specifically role models that will help us um, to think about the entrance into the kingdom of God. Another is, is Mark chapter 9, verses 33 through 37. Mark chapter 9, verses 33 through 37. It reads, they came to Capernaum. When he was in the house, he asked them, what were you arguing about on the road? But they kept quiet because on the way, they had argued about who was the greatest. Sitting down, Jesus called the twelve and said, if anyone wants to be first, he must be the very last and the servant of all. He took a little child and had him stand among them. Taking him in his arms, he said to them, whoever welcomes one of these little children in my name welcomes me. And whoever welcomes me does not welcome me, but the one who sent me. Again, Jesus performing the role of his mother as he took children and in his arms and committed them as models for the entrance into the reign of God or the kingdom of God. Another scripture, uh, Mark chapter 10, verses 13 through 16. Mark chapter 10, verses 13 through 16 reads, People were bringing little children to Jesus to have him touch them, but the disciples rebuked them. When Jesus saw this, he was indignant. He said to them, Let the little children come to me, and do not hinder them, for the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. I tell you the truth, anyone who will not receive the kingdom of God like a little child will never enter it. And he took the children in his arms, placed his hands on them, and blessed them. Again, Jesus taking upon himself, performing uh, the mother role as he took children into his arms and said to us, such is the kingdom of God. Uh, so Jesus accepted women and children. Let's look at Mark chapter 15. Uh, Mark chapter 15, uh, verses 40 and 41. Mark chapter 15, verses 40 and 41. It says, some women were watching from a distance. Mark chapter 15, verses 40 and 41. Among them were Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, the younger, and of Joseph and Salome. In Galilee, these women had followed him and cared for his needs. Many other women who had come up with him to Jerusalem were also there. So we see Jesus accepting women. And isn't it interesting that the first ones who were at the tomb and the first ones who told uh, the disciples that the tomb was empty were women. Uh, John chapter uh, 20, and we can, can read uh, verses 11 through 18 uh, to verify what I just said. John chapter 20, verses 11 through 18. We also see women who are part of the early church. Uh, the book of Acts talks about Peter, who had four daughters who proclaimed the word of God. Also, in uh, Romans chapter 16, uh, in which I just, I love uh, this scripture, especially uh, when, it, when it comes to uh, this whole notion of women um, being deacons of the church. It, it talks about for eBay, a servant of the Lord, for eBay, a servant of the Lord. And this is interesting because uh, in the Greek, uh, the word 
uh, for a servant of the church in Caesarea is diakonos. This diakonos is the same word that is used for uh, the first deacons in Acts chapter 6. Same word, diakonos, uh, the N-O-S. The ending is a neuter ending. Uh, it refers um, to both male and female, or it can be used for both male and female. So for eBay was a deacon in the church. She was a female deacon in the church at Centria. So diakonos means servant. Diakonos means deacon. Deacon means servant. So uh, we see her as a part of the early church. We can go on and on and on. Lydia and, and others. Uh, let me just read uh, a passage of scripture. Um, first, first Corinthians chapter 16, verse 19. First Corinthians chapter 16, uh, verse, verse 19. It reads, the churches in the province of Asia send you greetings, Aquila and Priscilla greet you warmly in the Lord. And again, here we have a husband and wife team uh, that are working in ministry together. And so uh, we see uh, Jesus valuing women. Uh, we see the early church having women as part of his ministry. And we see a woman psalmist tonight. And uh, we also see uh, many examples of the metaphor as God and uh, Jesus as mother. So that concludes Psalm 131. Brother Parker, any questions or comments? All right. All right. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much uh, for your support. Uh, on tonight, next week, we will take a look at Psalm 132. Uh, on Sunday is Pentecost Sunday, in which we celebrate the Holy Spirit, the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit. So join us at 8 o'clock and 11 o'clock. You can view worship live through our uh, website on 8 o'clock. You can get on our conference line to hear as well as our Facebook page. And then at 11 on our YouTube channel, uh, 9.30, uh, we will have our church school. And on Sunday, uh, since we normally have fifth Sunday worship, um, I ask that before uh, you uh, get on children's worship at 10 o'clock or after you get on children's worship uh, at 10 o'clock, uh, that you please join us at 8 or 11. We will uh, have something special for the children and youth of our church. And uh, we ask that since our youth are worshiping uh, at noon, then uh, parents uh, get your youth and children up at 8 uh, or 11 and worship together as a family because there will be something special uh, for um, the children since we will not be able to meet and this is a, a fifth Sunday. In addition to that, you can... Uh, send your tithes to the church. Thank you for your faithfulness in doing that. You can mail it to the church, 1636 East Capitol Street, Northeast Washington, D.C., 2003. You can have your bank descend it, or you can bring it to the church on Sunday uh, from 9.30 to 11 on Monday from 2 to 5, Tuesday from 4 
uh, to 7. You can drop off food at the same time. We're still partnering with serving the city. And you can also give through Givelify, PayPal, and the Cash App. And let me not forget, you should be getting information in your emails um, that we will have a family moving night on Friday night at 7 p.m. via Zoom. Uh, we will have a family moving night and since we celebrate our children and our children lead us in worship every fifth Sunday. And so we ask that that be uh, a family affair again on Friday night at 7 p.m. on our Zoom channel. Again, thank you for being in Bible study on tonight and thank you for those who will watch a little later as well. Let us pray. Father, we do thank you and we do praise you for this another day's journey and the opportunity to come to study your word. We thank you for illuminating our hearts and our minds, and we ask and pray that you would help us to put our faith, our trust, our dependence in you, just like a child does in his mother's arms. Bless us and keep us until we can meet again. In the name of the Christ, we pray and give thanks. Amen. Good night. Take care.